Hello everybody, uh, Dr. Rick dropping in on you here uh, in the age where we are going from sunny to rainy in 0 0.6 over and over again today. Uh, it is what it is, it's June in Houston. Look, uh, I wanna talk to you about something serious, something that I've been sharing with you guys literally for more than two decades now, and I have increasingly expressed my concerns and offered my insight and the fruit of my labor in research on this specific topic, but it goes beyond this specific topic, which is just one particular spoke in the will of dysfunction in the black community and I'm talking about African American adolescent and young adult male violence I started my research on that again over 20 years ago and I started to unveil what I discovered uh, as I stood on the shoulders of uh, some pretty great minds like Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania Dr. Joy DeGruy out of the University of of uh, Portland, more famously known for her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. But um, there's a great deal of work that had been done up until that point surrounding African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. And I grabbed that and I ran with it and I went deeper. I've shared with you the importance of proper socialization and the role it plays in the projection or the outcomes of the lives of young black males and the people that are in their periphery. And I'm talking about this because this week alone, uh, it was brought to my attention that an 18 year old girl who's a f uh, the daughter of a friend of a friend, uh, I don't know him personally, but he is obviously close to somebody I'm close to. His 18-year-old daughter was killed by her 20-year-old husband. Um, they had one child and one on the way, and there's a lot wrapped up in that, but that is unfortunately not uncommon to be that young. And that was a time you could be 18 and marry uh, some years and years ago with another generation and actually have a chance. The mental, emotional, and psychological preparation for that to take place isn't the same as it is today. An 18 year old is not equivalent, to, an 18 year old in 2024 is not equivalent to an 18 year old in the 50s. Not to say that either way, they are really truly prepared for everything that's coming. You're still learning, still developing into your 30s. Uh, you are, and you are always learning. But that was just one. And then another one, uh, a situation where a 15-year-old was shot and killed by her 21-year-old boyfriend. Yeah, I mean, something's wrong with that. Uh, but again, these are the things that are happening in our community. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in other communities, but we can't be consumed or concerned about what's going on in other communities when we haven't handled our business, when we have things unraveling, when we are consistently in last place in every major statistical category that leads out to the function of life, power, health, uh, finance, uh, and, and so many other different areas. We're the first to go to jail, the last to build wealth, and we don't see the correlation. But then we talk about this African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. I told you that there are five primary contributors to African-American adolescent and young adult male violence that have been identified. Number five, going up to uh, with number one being the most prevalent. Number five is uh, urban hassle. What is urban hassle? Urban hassle is what you experience growing up in the inner city. Hell, we experienced it so much, we didn't know that it was something uh, out of the ordinary, that it was something that wasn't good for our nervous system. We didn't understand. Urban hassle is the sirens in the middle of the night, the gun fire in the middle of the night, navigating gang violence and drug activity just to get to and from school. Uh, all you know, if you're in the Midwest on the East Coast, those L trains all times of the day and nights while you're trying to or should be studying and relaxing, 
so many other things that are directly related to inner city living that shock the nervous system. That's number five. Number four is be, be, uh, it, being a witness to violence. The more you witness violence, the more desensitized you come to it, and the more you become conditioned to execute violence in those particular instances. For instance, a person who has always seen people get hit when they don't do what someone tells them to, we eventually start hitting people. Well, not every person, but it's more likely to hit a person when a person doesn't do what they want them to or does something they don't want them to do. Uh, number three is actually being a victim of violence. Being a victim of violence, again, desensitizes you uh, to violence and it also trains you to be violent uh, when uh, certain things don't go the way you want them to. Uh, number two is the lack of proper racial socialization. What is socialization? Socialization is the preparation of any child to be acclimated into society. And that means what you do, what you don't do, uh, what you're capable of, how do you fit in society, the fact that you're beautiful, the fact that you're smart, the fact that all these different things, parents socialize their children to send them out into the world and to give them a positive viewpoint or mindset or self-image. And the thing is, what racial socialization is, is the black parent is labeled or are laden with an additional responsibility. We can't simply just say you're smart. We can't simply just say you are, you can do anything you want. We have to say, okay, when you go out there, you're going to have to be three times better. When you go out there, they're going to tell you you're ugly. When you go out there, they're going to tell you that your features aren't acceptable. When you go out there, they're going to attack your uh, physical appearance. They're going to, in all of these different things, and then you've got to reassure them that there's nothing wrong with them and that they can do it and all these different things. But you also have to prepare them for what their responsibilities would be, especially when you're talking about a male. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean specifically to be a black man? And then you have to sit up and say, okay, these are the things that you're going to be expected to do. This is what manhood looks like in the black community. This is what you're going to be expected. This is what you are aspiring to be. Real men do this, and you are setting a universal standard of what is expected of them. That socialization and racial socialization, and that is the the, the number two reason: the lack of race, proper racial socialization. Uh, number one is the feeling of being disrespected. The number one cause of violence among African American male, uh, adolescent, and young adult males is the feeling of being disrespected. It's hard to sit up and manage the feeling of being disrespected, uh, but it's something to be aware of. Dr. Jordan Grew, I want to say in 2000, created an African-American uh, adolescent respect scale. What it does is this respect scale allows you to be around young black males and to be able to observe behaviors, conversations, answers to certain questions, and predict their likelihood to commit an act of violence and thereby perform a proactive intervention and we've integrated all that stuff into the black men lead rite of passage initiative uh, if you've been around me for any time you've heard me talk about black men lead for years it's been around for more than a decade and we continue to press on to it's a rite of passage initiative it's literally properly racially socializing young black males especially young black males who don't have true manhood being modeled in their home and in their, in their community in any prevalent way. Uh, and so, but what we find is the thing that we can do that will allow us, come on, really? Sorry about that, y'all. Um, what you have to realize is the one thing that you can do is you can socialize a child. Trying to determine how they feel about their being disrespected or not being respected is an entirely different thing. Um, and that is of the utmost importance. And what I'm looking at when I see these kids killing each other or killing the young, I, I said this to the gentleman uh, at the Brothers Unfiltered event last night. For those who don't know, we do uh, a safe space for black men on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, I host it. Um, 
space was given to us by the Sunrise Project, which is a known project, which is uh, founded by uh, Kelly uh, Kelly Lawson, who is also over Joy um, PR firm, and they launched it basically because Kelly's oldest son uh, attempted to commit suicide and she launched it for black parents with young black male uh, sons who were dealing with addiction, dealing with mental health issues. And that's how I came into the play is about four or five years ago, I came in to work with her, to work with her son and ultimately ended up being a uh, ongoing resident expert in, the, in that area on the show, which is on every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and I've just been pushing for a space for men, pushing for a space for men. And so I was approached by the people at Sunrise what, about four months ago. And so we did our third uh, third session last night and it's deep. I'm talking about a place where men can be vulnerable, a place where men can admit that we have concerns of inadequacy, that we are struggling in certain areas, that we don't have all the answers, that we are overwhelmed, that we are having feelings of, um, are experiencing suicidal ideation, um, and so many other things. We talk about it all, and it's a no judgment zone. And in that conversation, I, I was explaining to them last night that we have got to understand that we are rearing our sons to kill our daughters. Not purposely, but because we are not doing it with a high level of intentionality, a high level of saying, this is what I'm going to do to get this result. This is what I'm teaching. This is how uh, available I'm going to be. Not just to my kids, but a group of kids. Not just in my community, but any way that I can make my presence felt. And that is what we need to be doing. We literally are rearing boys, black boys that are killing black girls. We, our sons are killing our daughters uh, at a rate that's unacceptable. One life is unacceptable, but the rate that we are experiencing right now is absolutely unacceptable. Is this the only thing going wrong in the black community? Absolutely not. But you got to understand something without the covering of men, without the protection of men, without women who can trust, without men our women can trust. We can't make any move, but I don't care how affluent our women become. I don't care how much they move up the corporate ladder. I don't care how much they stack their paper. If there isn't the covering of a man to protect it, it doesn't matter. And the thing is now they don't trust us. The thing is now we don't even know. The thing is now the those of us who do know and, and have a, a sense of what's going on, don't want to risk our lives to go back in the community, don't want to risk what we have. And just a lot of us are un unconcerned until it happens to our daughter, until it happens to our son, until it happens to our wife. Like I told you, on Juneteenth, just a, a, a Juneteenth celebration on Sunday, a black mother of three in Round Rock, which is literally right outside of Austin, Texas, was shot and killed along with another woman and 14 others injured by a young black male, 20 year old male, who just walked into this celebration and opened fire. And last I heard, he was still on the loose. So I don't know what the latest is. I need to check on that, but we have work to do. We have work to do and there's absolutely no way around it. We need to stop pretending that we haven't figured out. We are so caught up in the minor things, the popularity, the debates on social media, the look where I'm going this week or this look where I'm going next month, my birthday celebration, which is gonna take all month long, all these different things and the decline of our communities, the decline of our racial impact and social impact and political impact and economic impact is being they are my they're, they're bringing the immigrants in to replace us and we don't even see it and some of us are actually applauding it and advocating for it because we don't understand how things work how many times have i told you that 
we end up in last place because we don't understand how things work. I've talked about it. I've lectured about it. I've, gave you, I've given you lay conversations. I've written 28 books. I've given you lectures. I've given it to you in a highly scientific uh, dynamic. And I'm not the only one. I mean, there were many before me. There are many alongside me. And the problem is we're not heard because we don't have the little short, cute little productions going on. We don't have the catchphrases. We're not trying to go viral, but we're spitting the truth. We're giving you the thing that you can eat on, the thing that you can walk on, the thing that you can be sustained on. But you don't want that. You want to be entertained. And we're being entertained right into complete destruction. So, look, I'm going to get ready to get, get out of here. Um, I could talk about this all day. Uh, but we've got to do better, man. Two, two more babies, literally babies, 15 and 18, gone. One was pregnant, seven months pregnant, gone. Because we're not properly developing young black males. And that's just one particular situation or issue within our community. And there are many. We got to get on board. Um, for those who want to support the work we're doing with Black Man Lead, look in the description box and you can see how you can support the work. If those of you who want to set up Black Man Lead um, programs in your community, email us. The information is in there. Reach out to us uh, and we'll do the best we can to make it happen. We are severely undersourced for the work that we do in research, for the work that we do in program development and implementation and advocacy. Uh, I'm in jails, courthouses, school districts, and the funding isn't there, but I'm fighting anyway. We need support, but at the end of the day, we need people to become aware and active. But on that note, look, I'm gonna get out of here. You guys, thank you for giving me uh, 17 minutes of your time and we'll give you your day back. Take care.